All right, it sounds like the, those coming into the meeting are starting to slow down, so we'll go ahead and get started this morning. Again, welcome to everybody. Um, we appreciate you joining us here this morning for our quarterly State Technical Advisory Committee meeting. Uh, my name is Jeannie Hamilton, and I'm currently serving as your acting state conservationist for the NRCS here in South Dakota. Um, I'm, we've got 44 people on the call this morning, so we're not going to go around and do introductions, but I would ask that as you raise your hand or jump unmute yourself to speak, if you would just give us a really brief introduction of who you are um, and who you are maybe representing in the meeting today. Um, and other than that, you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself, um, but please keep your mics on mute if you're not speaking, and that'll just help us with the feedback as others are trying to speak. Um, one thing I want to share quickly with all of you, um, just so you're aware, where NBS yeah. currently. Oh, I'm getting some feedback right now. All right. I just wanted to let all of you know um, USDA is still being extremely cautious with allowable travel and things like that due to COVID and the current uptick in COVID cases that we're seeing across the country. So our offices are going to remain in the current status that we're in right now with limited staff within our offices and the doors locked to the public. Um, some ability to have folks enter the building through appointments and things like that, but uh, very limited as far as what we're going to be able to do here over the next few months as far as face to face meetings and conferences. So um, just so you're aware, if you are planning meetings and conferences and you're inviting NRCS to attend, if there's an ability for us to be there virtually, we will do everything we can to attend in that manner, but that it will be extremely limited what we're able to do in person. So I just wanted to share that with you all so that you're aware of that moving forward. Um, we've submitted a plan to start phasing our employees back into the office and start opening things back up, but that plan is not expected to even begin until next fiscal year starting October 1. So um, that's all I wanted to share before I kick it over to some of the other folks here in the meeting. Um, we've got a pretty full agenda and lots of things that I'm sure people want to visit about this morning, so I'm going to stop there and I see we've got some of our congressional representatives on and I would ask for comments and updates from them. And Ryan, you're on my screen, so if you have some updates, I'll kick it to you Great. first. Thanks, Junie. Uh, I'm Ryan Donnelly, Senator Thune's Ag Legislative Assistant out here in D.C. Um, just a couple updates on, on my end. I would flag that uh, USDA last week announced that they are going to extend the deadline to sign up for the Soil Health and Income Protection Program ship until the end of July. That's a three to five year option uh, within CRP. So just encourage folks to, to take a look at that. Um, we also got some some good news uh, recently on a hang and grazing issue that we've been working on on prevent plant acres. Um, obviously, more would have been more helpful uh, in the last two years when we were extremely wet. Um, but pleased with the uh, decision that they're going, they're going to, to remove the November one day restriction on hang and grazing cover crops on those prevent plant acres moving forward. Um, and then lastly, I would just flag that we're, you know, monitoring the drought and um, CRP and looking at hang and grazing flexibilities there um, and appreciate that that's on the agenda and that you all are looking at that. And you know, we're, we're pretty familiar with how the farm bill was written and the um, restrictions that are in place on it uh, specific to hang, but just appreciate that that's something that you all are, are taking a look at and uh, let us know if there's anything we can do to help. Thank you. All right, thank you. Other congressional updates? 
Sorry, I can't see my full list of who's on here this morning. Hey, I'd, I'd jump in. This is Katie with Congressman Dusty Johnson's office, and I don't have a lot to add. I'm just looking forward to, you know, the, the presentation today and getting new news to help folks out here, too. But I'm on. All right, thank you, Katie. Other questions or comments from our congressional representatives or for them? This is Rebecca Herman. I'm with Senator Brown's office. My colleague Jim uh, was going to hop on, but he might have gotten caught, caught up with something else that came up. So um, I guess I would just echo the other congressional offices looking forward to listening in today. And um, if Jim, Jim happens to hop on, he might have a few things to add, but nothing from Senator Rounds team at this time. All right, thank you. All right, then with that, I will kick it over to Joe and Owen for some updates from the FSA office. Thanks, Jeannie. Uh, Joe was not able to be on today. He had a conflicting call that he was had to be on. Uh, so I'll just have to take the reins for FSA. So my name is Owen Fagerhog, Conservation Program Manager for the Farm Service Agency up in Huron. Uh, just going to touch on some of the conservation related items today, provide some updates on some sign up deadlines and opportunities in front of us for the Conservation Reserve Program. And then I'll, um, I guess, address the elephant in the room, I would say, is with the emergency hay graze opportunities and what we can and can't do and, and kind of how that all works. Uh, so first off, we've got a suite of conservation practices currently in front of us for, for sign up opportunities. Uh, the continuous CRP and CREP sign up uh, has a deadline of August 6th to uh, make application for the continuous CRP. General CRP is the probably the earliest deadline, and that's coming up here July 23rd. So the end of this week is the deadline for the general CRP sign up. SHIP sign up, the Soil Health Income Protection Program, uh, was extended through July 30th. So we've got a couple weeks, week and a half left on that. And then the most recent one added uh, for sign up opportunity was the CRP Grasslands, the Working Lands Program. And that sign up started July 12th and runs through August 20th. So we have uh, quite a few options on the table for producers to look at and entertain when they come in to look at conservation on their landscape. Um, in addition to that, another conservation related program that we have currently going on is ECP, Emergency Conservation Program. Uh, we did have some wildfires earlier this spring where it helps restore the infrastructure, the fence, the conservation structures that may have been damaged by that wildfire. But the most prevalent one we have in the state right now would be the ECP drought. So to help provide emergency water to livestock producers for watering facilities and to get emergency water on the pasture that's affected by the drought. Uh, so got a lot going on on those two programs. And uh, lastly, just wanted to look at or discuss the uh, emergency hay and grazing provisions, try to give a high level overview of where we're at with that. So to qualify for emergency paying on CRP, a county needs to do one of two things. They need to be at least a D2 on the, the drought monitor, the US drought monitor, or be able to show a 40% below normal and moisture for the previous four months. Uh, hitting the drought monitor D2 has not been a challenge for South Dakota this year. Uh, we've got a high percentage of counties that are currently eligible for emergency haying and grazing. <coughs> that uh, authority on the haying piece does not allow the participant to hay until we get through the primary nesting season date of August 1. And so August 2nd would be the first available date for folks to uh, exercise the emergency haying provisions if they've made application and have approvals and those things from, uh, from their local FSA office. The 
The other provision in um, the other provision in regards to the emergency haying is if a county, if the drought severity gets the county to a LFP livestock feed program eligibility, uh, it limits the grazing to a 50% accepting rate, limit the paying opportunity to only eight CP practices at a 50% of the acreage. Uh, in, in light of both of those provisions under the emergency, the non-emergency provisions are also applicable for any participant to exercise. If the participant can meet or the acreage can meet the frequency for the haying, which would be once every third year, and the, hay, the participant cannot hay more than 75% of the acreage, and they must pay the payment reduction when they're doing the non-emergency. So each, each county has specific criteria, obviously, based on the drought monitor designation and the LFP triggers, if they've been met or not. And then each acreage is also going to have to be looked at as far as the CP practice on the landscape, uh, the frequency in which it had been hayed previously, for non-emergency provisions and, and such. So it's not a blanket, one size fits all. It's we have to make application, evaluate, and see what works best for that participant. So are there any questions in regards to my comments so far? They're taking it easy on us today, Jeannie. Good morning. This is Crystal Smith with South Dakota Farm Bureau. Yes. Oh, and thank you for your um, update and for sharing uh, the details of all the benchmarks that need to be hit before um, CRP acres are opened. Um, you know, I guess as we're, we've been hearing from a lot of our members throughout the state, um, this is a really, really critical time. And um, you know, in some cases, the CRP acres are even too far um, gone to even, um, you know, be available for uh, quality um, feedstock. So I guess we would just like to um, register our request for um, an early access to that. And I know that there are lots of details that have to happen, but um, is there any discussion about um, opening those acres early? What information can we help with? Um, it, does it help to have uh, testimonials from our members? Are you hearing from you know any of your clients? Um, I guess I'd just like to have a little further conversation about that because I think it's um, a really critical time. And as we know, um, you know the the hay is in short supply and increasing in price, and so we just want to be able to do whatever we can to help our producers so they're not um, having to face reduction of herd. Okay. So yeah, I can speak to the, the primary nesting season dates and kind of what we've learned on how that process takes place or how that process uh, is looked at. So uh, we, we are aware from the agency standpoint that the congressionals had put forth a memo requesting a July 15th release on the CRP emergency haying. Um, it's not as simple as just saying, yep, we can, we can open it up July 15th to to change the way the statute is written, it reads that the, the activity cannot be completed during the primary nesting season. So to open it up early, we would have had to change the primary nesting season end date. Whether we wanted to look at it as a temporary or a permanent basis, it didn't matter. Uh, to change a primary nesting season end date takes a full environmental evaluation or environment, environmental assessment of that date to see what impacts there would be. And with that, there comes is a requirement that there's a 30 day comment period for the for the public to comment on that specific change or that environmental assessment. By the time that this got pushed and started getting looked at and you did the math on the 30 days, there was no way we could speed it up to realize anything prior to the August 2nd date that we're currently um, bound to. So uh, something that can be looked at in the future, uh, some better planning for forethought on impacts when we get into these situations. 
but I guess I would defer to the wildlife community and the conservation partners on, you know, any dialogue on impacts to the actual conservation, the wildlife, you know, that we're protecting with the CRP acreage and those types of things. Um, because sometimes when we look at things, it opens up Pandora's box and it may be more restrictive than less restrictive if we get into some of these other situations. But uh, it was looked at, it was, you know, evaluated within the agency and NRCS. You know, we worked in conjunction together, uh, but just did not have any latitude to to do anything. Um, I don't know what response I've not been afforded or seen a copy if any response was afforded to the congressionals on their inquiry. Um, but that's the that's the guidance and direction that we got within the agencies. So. I don't know if Jeannie or Jeff, if you have anything to offer on that. <clears throat> yeah, I appreciate that overview, Owen, and that is in line with with how things have happened over the last month here through those discussions. And, um, you know, we we do hear and see the stress out there from the farmers and the ranchers, and we understand their concerns. But as Owen said, you know, our responsibilities as an agency and to the the ground and the reason behind CRP being there. Um, we do have to make sure that we're evaluating all of our resources and the impacts to those and not making those really quick decisions that don't take into account all the, the different resources and the different um, partners and input and allowing everybody the ability to to voice their their concerns and support. So. Okay, well, I, I do appreciate that. And thank you for taking a look at it. Um, you know, I guess what what I'm hearing is we really need to start earlier in years that might have predictions of, of uh, you know, some drought conditions. Can I ask one more question, Owen? And, and I have to confess that I do not know a lot about this program, but heard from a couple of my members regarding the emergency water resources. Um, and um, just some questions about streamlining that process. My understanding from those conversations um, are that, um, you know, there needs to be an environmental assessment um, in those cases too. And my understanding is that some of those resources are kind of backed up due to lack of staffing. Is that an accurate understanding? And is there anything we can do to try to, um, you know, kind of help those people out there that, that need to expedite that process? Yeah. No, your understanding is correct. When we're installing permanent installation of a watering facility, so we're burying pipeline, putting down a permanent tank, that does require that environmental review. And there's a, a lot of times we have to consult with the State Historic Preservation Office, uh, Tribal Historic Preservation Office, some different folks that have opportunities to, to comment if there's findings of impact out there. And they have a 30-day window in which they can respond. If they don't respond within the 30 days, that's our green light to go forward. Uh, so that is the probably that timing. Uh, in some cases, there needs to be a professional archaeologist on site to go out and do some evaluations. Uh, depending on their workload, I'm sure there's some time frames there that that can be a little bit more restrictive. Uh, but the fail safe for the one that I guess I we try to promote the most is if it's a true emergency and things that there are temporary measures that can be taken place. Temporary pipeline across the ground, uh, temporary tank. Those don't have the same. Same parameters because we're not disturbing that ground. We're not burying that pipe. So folks do have the temporary option, you know, the band aid fix, so to speak, to get the water out there. So. There are some things that we can help mitigate in those instances. Understand permanence better because we don't have to address it the next time it gets dry. Uh, but we do have things that we have to have to abide by as we go through that process. Uh, anytime there's federal dollars attached to that, we need to be sure we're checking the boxes. So, okay, thanks for that explanation. Yep, you're welcome. And I'll stick around here on the call. Uh, hey, Owen, know. this is Jim Selchert with Senator Rounds office. Yes, sir. Hey, yeah. so what, one of the issues that we run into with constituents concerns is our our nesting season for our state is is like July 9th or 10th. 
And then our federal one is August 1st, so they can start the early haying or graze haying um, on August 2nd. And so that, you know, we're dealing with the same species, I assume. So they just want to know why the difference. And I guess I can't answer the question. So the, the date that I have stuck in my head is July 15th for a lot of our easement programs. And then it's August 2nd for our conservation programs. And the way it was explained to me, and I think the best way that I can explain it back is the July 15th date, the easement prohibits breaking of that acreage for farming purposes. It maintains that grass cover out there. Okay. It's, it's not particularly targeted at the nesting, the wildlife benefits of those things. The August 2nd date is the conservation reserve program, which has those enduring benefits, the wildlife targets those types of things and that nesting season goes longer for those types of the things that we're trying to protect we go to that august 2nd date for those reasons so it's it's the not breaking the grass on the july 15th and it's the enduring benefits the conservation cover for that august 2nd date and that's how it was explained to myself so okay well you know going forward we're going to have to work together and come up with solutions because you know, for the constituents, this is just not workable waiting this late when we've got hay prices going north of three, three hundred and four hundred dollars a ton. It's just not workable for those those folks with livestock. So we're yeah. gonna, I mean, obviously I, I'll be the lead from this office on it, but we're going to have to do something different because when the governor can release all the state ground that early, and then we have federal ground and, and we've got similar situations and we're, we're following different rules for the same region and it just doesn't make sense to the constituent so I'll, i assure you that all of the crp acreage is following the same rule yeah so understand the concern though um I guess it's it's the policy that we have in place today. Well, I understand where we're sitting today, and then that, and I understand that there's some some uh, limitations as to what you guys can do based on what's in statute. But but we're going to have to address this because we will have a drought again someday. It's we're one day closer to to getting out of this one, and probably a day closer to the next one. So right. Thanks, uh, Owen. Absolutely. Uh, you know, we're here to work together and and follow what, what's been passed and try to enact it the best we can. So, but understand and hear the concern. My dad's in the same boat. We're about a quarter of the hay crop we had last year. And right. fortunately these late rains we've had or these last three weeks of rains is gonna at least make silage and some corn. So it's gonna stretch what forage we do have a little bit further. Sure. Thanks. Yep, thank you. Turn it back to you, Jeannie. All right, thanks, Owen. Um, so next on the agenda, we have some of our staff here at the state office on our um, technical staff talking about some things that we can maybe be thinking about ahead of that next potential drought and what we can do to be a little more prepared for that. So Jess, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thanks, Jeannie. Um, as uh, most of you are aware, I'm Jessica Mahalski, State Resource Conservationist for South Dakota NRCS, and hopefully you can see the presentation on the screen. Can somebody let me know that it's up and working? Looks good. Yep. Okay. Um, so obviously, uh, drought uh, is a is a very big concern um, to all of us on this call today. Um, those of us that are producers and uh, and uh, employees of NRCS and other other partner agencies, uh, very concerned about the impact that the drought is having on our farmers and ranchers. Um, and so we just we wanted to take it some time here because I think it's it's pretty impactful. Um, with the situation that we're in right now to really think about this situ current situation and think about what we can do in years to come um, to really have a good plan in place ahead of the drought so that we can really build that resiliency to drought. Um, 
and I know a lot of producers that that work with us and with our partners um, really are more resilient during these times, and I think it, it can make a huge difference. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Emily Helms, our state range management specialist, and uh, then she'll be followed by Marsha Denicky, our state agronomist. All right, thanks, Jess. So um, I'm gonna start off talking about grassland planning, uh, basic planning for um, conservation and resilience. So when, when we start as an agency with planning, um, we usually start off by inventorying our resources. So for a producer, they don't, they can go through NRCS to go through this plan or they can do it themselves. But so we want to inventory our resources or develop a, a document of what you have on all of your grazing lands. And this doesn't just have to be the grass. This inclu can include cropland if you intend to graze it. So you want to document your pastures. How many pastures do you have? What size? What kind of forage is available for, for grazing? And then what infrastructure do you have in each of those pastures? Fences, your water sources, be it a, a pipeline or a dam. What sensitive areas do you have? Do you have anything that maybe is more sensitive to erosion, like in sandy soils? Um, and then what animals do you have to graze those acres? So you have your cattle, what kind of cattle, how, how much are they gonna eat, what size, the numbers. And also we wanna consider our wildlife because a lot of people in South Dakota utilize wildlife as another income source. So when we're considering grazing a piece of land, we also wanna consider leaving some behind, not only for the health of the ground, but also for wildlife production. So then the next step after, so as you're uh, inventorying your rangeland, um, we have a couple of tools that can help with this inventory. Uh, the South Dakota Drought Tool uses precipitation data to determine the status of grassland forage production. So it uses a two-year weighted average to help predict and also determine the current status of production. And then we also have the South Dakota Grazing Tool. Uh, this uses soils information to help you develop your forage inventory and then also has uh, worksheets that help you ba balance that forage with the amount of animals you have. And then you can also develop a grazing plan within this worksheet. So it's pretty handy. And we have um, a couple of videos on how to use it as well. So it's uh, used by a lot of our partners in developing grazing plans as well. Go ahead, Jess. Um, so then, after you've gotten your inventory, you've maybe put it into the grazing tool, figured out where you're standing. You you want to figure out, you want to assess those resources. Do you have enough forage for a normal year? And then can you, you can just figure out where you need to cut back or where you need, you can add more animals. Um, and then are your water sources adequate for all years? Do you have good water for drought? And are your water sources going to be adequate in a flood? Like, are your dams going to run over and you're going to have this issue in your pastures because you have too much water? Like, you want to think about all the cases, not just like a normal year. And then is your land healthy? Is it resilient? Do you have the right plants where they should be? Um, are they going to bounce back after a drought? Or are we going to have to like reduce stocking next year as well because they get overgrazed too often? And like, we wanna make sure that we're always planning for a drought, hoping for rain, but making sure that our grasslands are resilient with good grazing management. So as you're planning all this, consider what improvements you wanna make first and what goals you have for the future so that um, we're not always hoping, we're not always like in a rush and just making sure that we're resilient in our decisions. And then, Determine how and what improvements will help you reach those goals. So the first step is to build a plan of action to address any of the areas of improvement needed. You want to build a grazing plan to help build resiliency. 
So building rotations, rest, and increasing recovery periods helps to build resiliency on grasslands. New York can also utilize cropland resources to give pastures rest when needed, maybe planting a cover crop, grazing corn stalks or something like that to give your grass acres a rest is always a good option. And writing a contingency, contingency plan to address any issues that may arise during the year. So con consider what happens during a drought, how are you going to get through those dry years when there's less forage? What are, what are you gonna do during a wet period? And then what other, what's your plan for other natural disasters like hail or tornadoes? Or if you have an early blizzard, what's that gonna look like for your operation? It's good to have all of this stuff written down. So then when some kind of like event occurs, you have this roadmap already built, so you're not so stressed out during that time frame. You can just go, oh, I have a plan in place. This is what I'm going to do. And then you can use those action steps to help you through. And then you're not so stressed because like stressful situations just make everything even worse. So having a plan is always a good, a good plan. Uh, and then um, so having an action plan, having due dates assigned when those improve for those improvements. So when I'm going to put that pipeline in, when I'm going to build that fence, when I'm going to start rotational grazing. Those are always it's a good way to help hold you accountable and it also helps you build that roadmap for success. And so NRCS, we have these planners in place across the state that can help you develop these plans and they can help explain new technologies or help you brainstorm ideas and practices that may help you along the way. Um, and our partners are also awesome and excellent at this as well. So um, getting in, involved with the local office is a great step to for the to plan ahead of the next drought. Thanks, Emily. Um, so I guess, you know, sometimes we think about um, why do we want to include um, drought planning on our cropland acres? You know, we have crop insurance. Why do we want, you know, why do we want to take that into consideration? And I guess the biggest reason that we want to think about that is that agriculture is usually the first economic sector to be affected by drought. When we have a drought, you know, our soil moisture decreases, and sometimes that can happen very rapidly. Um, the crop health is impacted, our yields are impacted. Um, and we often, you know, not just, uh, we often not only have a lack of precipitation, but we have high winds and high temperatures, right? And so all of those things are contributing to what's going out, what's going on into the, uh, in the field. And so, um, the effects of egg drought, you know, depend on on a lot of things, including timing and susceptibility of when that when that happens. Um, you know, so if we have a period of water and temperature stress, you know, that, that period might coincide um, with the critical development stage of one crop, one crop while you know, maybe missing that critical weather sensitive stage of a different crop. So when we um, think about drought planning and, and, we're, and we're considering, you know, what we want to do, we really want to look at what are the negative impacts associated with the cropping system that we're considering, right? Nothing's 100% full foolproof, right? We always have benefits and some associated negatives that we have to overcome, right? So when we think about drought conditions, we know that our growing plants experience stress, right? They have, um, it could be due to a lack of nutrients or um, adequate moisture. We know that hot, dry weather slows our biological organisms and therefore that anticipated decomposition of organic matter doesn't occur at the same rate it would in a normal year. Um, 
We have increased risk of offsite movements of, of new, unused nutrients. You know, our plants are not taking up maybe all the nutrients that we applied. So things that we want to consider is, would there be a benefit to split application of nutrients? You know, had I put those nutrients on in two, um, in two operations, could that have given me the ability to maybe reduce that rate? Um, you know, and you have to counteract that with that additional trip over the field. Which one is going to give you a bigger benefit? Um, you know, bare or minimally, minimally covered soils often result in higher soil temperatures, which increase moisture losses due to evaporation. So how do we, you know, how are we going to mitigate that? What are the things that we can do to keep that soil covered? Um, and then when that soil is bare, we increase that risk of, of erosion, right? So what can we do to minimize that risk? And then, you know, we a lot of times we talk about the benefits of cover crops and they have a lot, a lot of benefits. But when we have little or no precipitation, the benefits of cover crops, just like, you know, all of our other agricultural processes, you know, those benefits are reduced. And so we have to maybe make changes to the type of uh, mix that we're choosing or when we're terminating that mix. So these are all things that need to be considered when we're thinking about uh, and planning for drought. So, you know, when we plan, when we plan for drought, um, you know, having a good drought plan in place can help, can help our operation. Like Emily said, you know, knowing what you're, you're going to do and having that plan in place can help reduce stress. Um, when we evaluate that operation, we need, we, we want our drought plan to be part of a comprehensive conservation plan that considers what kind and of resources we have, but also what's, what condition are those resources in? Like, where, where's our starting point? Where's our benchmark? What are we working with? And then um, our plan needs to consider how those crops, forages, or other resources have reacted to drought in the past, right? I mean, this is not our first drought. So we need to think about how did those resources that we have react to drought in the past? So there are some things, right? There are some things that we know right? The ability of a soil to capture and retain moisture over a growing season can, can act like a bank account against, you know, which our crops and our forages can draw on, right? And so doing those type of things that kind of fill that, fill that checkbook back up are going to help when we get into a low uh, precipitation situation like what we're in now, right? We know that there are a number of conservation practices that can positively affect that water holding capacity of our soils. I know, um, you know, Kent has talked a number of times about all the soil health practices um, that we can use to, to increase that water holding capacity of our soil, um, improve the retention of that water, and then reduce that vulnerability, uh, which reduces that vulnerability to drought, right? And, and trying to increase that soil organic matter so that we have um, more, more water holding capacity. Um, you know, and that increased soil organic matter, you know, improves our soil structure, it improves our porosity, it improves our infiltration. So when we think about those practices, you know, there's a, there's a number of practices that we have, but you know, if we think about what are the big players, right? Um, crop rotation. When I looked at South Dakota's uh, drought mitigation plan um, following the 2012, the 2012 drought, one of the big things that stood out was South Dakota as a state identified that the lack of diverse crops and lack of rotation was probably, you know, a very large vulnerability um, of crop production in South Dakota, right? So we know that 
growing different kinds of crops that have different needs for moisture at slightly different times tends to spread out that risk, right? A diverse crop rotation um, interrupts the weed and pest cycles. It replenishes the, you know, uses and replenishes different nutrients and often results in increased yields in that traditional corn soybean crop, right? Rotations um, involving crops with higher crop residue can reduce our surface crusting and our water runoff and improve our soil moisture um, for that next crop, right? And these ecosystems, you know, that are diverse usually are more stable they tend to be able to withstand disturbances and they are better able to recover um, than a less diverse system. You know, another key, another key player is residue management, right? Keeping the soil covered substantially lowers the soil temperature and reduces water loss from evaporation, something that is extremely critical during times of drought. Um, leaving last year's plant residue on the field, um, you know, using practices like no-till or, or mulch-till um, can help, um, help the soil reduce soil temperatures and water loss um, while building that soil organic matter. Um, cover crops. You know, cover crops need to be used, I mean, we need to understand what, what, what we're doing and how, how we're using them. But cover crops can improve a farm's climate resilience. They keep the soil covered and therefore uh, cooler while increasing organic matter in the soil. So we know that, you know, approximately 1% of organic matter in soil can hold as much as 20 gallons of water or 20,000 gallons of water you know, per acre. So, you know, those higher amounts of organic matter, you know, deeper in the soil profile are going to allow that soil to absorb and retain more moisture. Jess? Okay, thank you, Emily and Marcia. Appreciate it. Um, the one last thing, a few things that I wanted to close with, um, you know, we've had a lot of discussions between Farm Service Agency and NRCS and those types of things about, you know, programs like grassland CRP or uh, land that is is highly erodible and those types of things. And, you know, what do we do uh, when we have a conservation plan in place and the drought happens and we we have uh, we have plans um, but even the best laid plans, of course, sometimes need to change. Um, the biggest thing is to talk to your local NRCS and Farm Service Agency office. If you need to make changes to your, your grazing plan or you need to make changes to a, uh, a highly erodible plan, um, you know, the big thing is, is that we can assist producers in walking through those changes that need to be made. Um, discuss what other plans or alternatives you have. If you have a pasture that you typically rest for X amount of time and you need feel like you need to get into that um, pasture earlier um, and, and not able to rest it as long, make sure you're communicating that back um, to the NRCS office and we can you know definitely help see what the risks are. Um, maybe we you know need to evaluate if it's if you're better off culling, um, some livestock versus versus um, you know grazing something more than we would want to. So just and and document what your decisions are. R review and document what worked or didn't work. Um, it's going to be extremely important to document that for the next drought going forward. And uh, and that's what our our staff is there for is to assist producers um, even when they need to make changes to their to their plan. Uh, we do have some resources listed here, and we will plan to send out this this PowerPoint presentation when we when Kathy sends out the minutes, so you'll have access to those uh, websites. Um, and then this is our contact information. Um, again, I'm the state resource conservationist. Emily Helms is the range management specialist, 
and Marsha Denneke is a state agronomist and we uh, would be happy to visit with anybody that has any questions. Uh, so that's all I have. Jeannie, if there's any question, if there's no questions, then I'll turn it back to you. Any questions at all? Okay, thanks a bunch. All right, thank you. Um, we appreciate the, the information from you and your staff, Jess. So um, since I don't see anybody coming off mute or raising their hands, we will go ahead and move to the next item on the agenda. And Colette, I will turn it over to you for discussion on CIG. Good morning, everyone. So the Conservation Innovation Grant Program is one where we can use um, uh, ideas that have been used by other people out in the field for uh, technologies. And but they, those practices may or may not may not be part of our um, NRCS toolbox for helping producers. So it's an opportunity where we can um, test those out and we can uh, do some science and uh, study those a little bit and then we can incorporate them to become part of our, our suite of practices that are uh, available through the Farm Bill programs. So this year we did have uh, a call for proposals and we had a few applications and those applications are under review right now. So uh, not a whole lot to say yet, but hopefully soon we'll have more to say. So thank you. All right, thank you, Colette. Are there any questions on the CIG program? All right, if not, we'll continue down through some of our other programs out there. Um, Jeff Vanderwilt, I'll turn it over to you for an update on CIS. You bet. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to apologize right off the start that doing a little work at home last night, I got into something. The old allergies are flaring up this morning. So uh, if I don't sound the best and we got a little sniffle going, I apologize for that right off the get go. But um, I wanna give you a little history on, or go back in history a little bit on CIS here for a second. Um, back in 2020 was the first year that we did a call for proposals uh, for the conservation implementation strategy. And we uh, we got 16 proposals that first year, and out of those 16, we we funded 12 of those, and all 12 um, have done something so far here in 2021. Uh, whether it's just some outreach, uh, trying to develop uh, conservation plans and contracts with producers, or just doing some of the initial inventory on some of the. Uh, uh, projects that they have going. So we had again 16 total applications or proposals in 20 and we funded 12. Now in 2021 we did another call for proposals last November and uh, <clears throat> those uh, the selections were made here in May and I kind of wanted to give you a quick update that we received um, 36 uh, proposals this year and we were able to fund 16 of those. So I wanted you to know that uh, I'm excited. Uh, obviously we doubled the number of proposals we had. Um, obviously we couldn't fund all of them due to um, funding restraints and the amount of funding that we have available to us. But uh, I was very excited that we were able to have that many more uh, proposals get submitted here in 2021. Um, as of right now, the plan looks like um, we will um, do another call for proposals in November uh, and kind of stick to our sim uh, similar time frame that we have in the past with a call for proposals in uh, November and then the um, due date being uh, late April or mid to late April. So just uh, kind of anticipate that coming back out and hopefully we will have um, uh, a fair amount of funding to uh, fund some proposals then in uh, 2022 as well. So as these projects continue to progress along, I will continue to give you more of a detailed update. Uh, obviously, with this being really the first year that we've obligated any contracts, there's not a whole lot of results um, to discuss just yet, but we are hopefully, you know, obviously moving in that direction. So I will at this point just be giving you updates on the number of proposals we've gotten and how many we've been able to fund. Um, 
Uh, next on the list is going to be updating the website so that I can show you the location of all these new proposals. Uh, we haven't gotten that done yet, still working on that, but uh, we're hopefully can get these uh, 16 proposals loaded on our website on the map so that you can see where uh, we're funding and what work we're doing um, through these conservation implementation strategies. So kind of stay tuned for that and hopefully I'll be able to continue to kind of give you just brief updates and, and show you some more information as as time goes on. So anybody have any questions on where we're at with this conservation implementation strategy? OK, with that, I I'm going to skip over here a little bit in the agenda, because if you look, um, I am not next on the list, but second on the list next to talk about the Regional Conservation Partnership Program. And since I'm already on, I'm just going to cover RCPP as well. So um, we've had some uh, RCPP projects in the past. We have one um, that is still active that we're trying to wrap up with Ducks Unlimited in the Prairie Pothole region here uh, between North Dakota and South Dakota uh, and actually Minnesota a little bit. So we're working on wrapping that one up. That one should actually kind of more or less be finalized this year um, as far as all the funding goes. Uh, and, and as that one gets wrapped up, then we'll have um, some details come out on, on what they all accomplished once we get that wrapped up. But that was a multi-state project. And that one's getting close to wrapping up. However, I do want to bring up the fact that we have seven new projects um, in the works right now here in South Dakota, or at, we got a couple multi-state ones, but I'll cover the ones uh, first that are um, led by South Dakota. So if it's a multi-state project, South Dakota is a lead state. So uh, the first one is our, our, our alternative funding arrangement, which is kind of a different category through our CPP where we actually give the funds a majority of the funds to the partner to actually write the contracts and implement the practices uh, versus how a lot of our normal rcpp works is the partner requests some fa and and nrcs actually works to do the planning and the contracting and the implementation with these alternative funding arrangements uh, more of that responsibility is placed on the partner so Ducks Unlimited was awarded an alternative funding arrangement. And right now we're in the process of of getting that agreement in place. Um, this one also covers the Prairie Pothole region of Montana, North Dakota and South Dakota. And we've got Bruce on a little later on in the um, program here to talk about that project a little bit. So he'll cover that um, uh, specifics on what that DU project is going to accomplish. But South Dakota is the lead state and we've submitted everything to get that agreement in place. So hopefully we can get that approval here soon and then we'll be able to start doing some implementation work uh, with Ducks Unlimited on that. The other one, another one that we have was with the James River Water Development District. Um, this one was actually a renewal. There is a renewal option in RCPP as well as a project um, comes close to its um, finalization date or expiration date, uh, there is an option for that partner to do a shortened application uh, and, and apply for renewal, which is basically kind of just an extension of the existing project, maybe make a few updates or a few tweaks to it. Uh, but Rocky with, with James River Water Development District uh, did put in for renewal and got that one funded as well. Um, and that one too, we are working on getting that agreement in place and Rocky will be on here towards the end too to discuss what that project's going to look like and, and maybe discuss a little bit about the experience he had with his original uh, project proposal. And then the classics or the, the other ones that we got funded uh, through the normal RCPP process. Um, we have one with the Minnehaha Conservation District. That one, uh, Barry with the Minnehaha Conservation District there in East Water Development District, East Dakota Water Development District, um, actually had a previous RCPP project. They applied for a renewal. They didn't get that, so they put in for the classic and was able to uh, get that project funded that way. So we will continue to work with Barry uh, on that project over there in the Big Sioux watershed. 
And then the Belfouche River Watershed Partnership also put in for one. And so that one, the agreement's actually in place and we're working to get things set up to um, start doing some contract obligation and, and applications and those kinds of things. So that one's, that one's moving along really well. Um, and then a couple that we've just started working on, these were kind of recently funded ones. Uh, we did, we got one funded with the Roberts Conservation District up there in the Northeast corner of the state. And then we also have one funded with the World Wildlife Fund. That one actually covers parts of Western South Dakota and the Sand Hills of Nebraska. So that is another multi-state one. We'll be working with Nebraska on that, but South Dakota is the lead state. And then the last one, um, Audubon had one funded. That one covers North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. And then that particular case, Audubon uh, actually has North Dakota as the lead state. I don't have much of an update on the Audubon one since North Dakota is the lead state. Um, I haven't heard how the agreement process is going from North Dakota yet, but I would assume that it's progressing along as well. Uh, the last thing I would tell you is that we had four um, new applications for um, alternative funding arrangements, similar to that one that DU got funded earlier that I talked about. Uh, we had four more uh, partners apply for the AFAs. Roughly, I would guess that we're probably going to have two of those funded out of the four. Um, they received, I believe it was 36 or 37, um, something on that order uh, nationwide. And out of those 36 or 37, South Dakota had four of them. So um, kind of my anticipation is I, I think we'll get two of them funded out of that, out of the four, just because they, they're going to fund about 15 projects total. Um, so I'm kind of anticipating us getting two of the four funded. So we're just waiting on kind of the official word or the official announcement on which one of our four will will get approved. So as soon as we hear something back on that, we'll give you an update on that as well. So that's kind of where we're sitting with RCPP. Um, you know, I guess if I'm going to point anything out to you guys just to make sure that you're aware this is all additional dollars being brought into the state to work on specific projects. So these are, you know, in, in the past, these were EQIP and CSP dollars. Now these, these are RCPP has become its own program in the 2018 Farm Bill. So these do not diminish from our EQIP or CSP dollars we receive. So these are all additional funds um, that we receive in order to do conservation work here in South Dakota. Um, unless it's a multi-state project, but even still, um, at least a portion of those dollars are coming to South Dakota. So it's very exciting. Uh, you know, we've had three total, three, four total projects in the past. Um, and over the, about the last 12 months, we've gotten seven um, new ones funded and probably two more coming. So in about the span of 12 to 16 months, we really increased the RCPP um, uh, funding here in South Dakota. So I'm very excited about that. Obviously that leads to more work, but we've got all great partners that we're working with on these projects and I'm really excited to uh, to get to working on them and seeing what kind of outcomes we can create with these projects. So that's kind of my quick update on RCPP. Um, if you guys got any questions, uh, I'd be happy to take those now as well. Um, maybe the last thing I would say is I would anticipate another announcement uh, for RCPP Classic funding to come this fall. Don't know exactly when, but I would guess September, October-ish, somewhere in there. So we'll see what happens there. Any questions on RCPP and kind of where we're at, what we're up to? All right. Uh, I will uh, turn this over to Derek. Derek Oliver is our um, acting EQIP program manager. Most of you know Jen Wirtz. Uh, Jen is actually doing a detail of her own. Um, and so Derek is filling in uh, for Jen while Jen has gone on detail. So Derek's gonna give you the EQIP update this, this quarter. So Derek, I'll turn it over to you. All righty, thank you. Good morning. I'm gonna share my screen here real quick. Okay, so 
Um, I'm going to start with our general funds here. Um, basically, you see up here in the upper left, we're going to start with the strike force funds um, and the individual breakdowns for each tribe. Uh, you can see we have um, two left here, uh, one in Standing Rock, one in Pine Ridge that we have yet to, to fund. Other than that, we're pretty much wrapped up there. Um, animal waste management, um, beginning farmer rancher and our socially disadvantaged fund pools. You can see we've uh, pretty much allocated those funds already. Um, getting down to our watershed um, fund pools. You can see we've um, allocated all those funds. So in total here for our general funds, uh, we've allocated 12.15 million dollars. We assessed uh, 580 applications. We funded 199 entirely out of uh, this fund pool. We have another 186 here that we've uh, either partially funded um, in the in other fund pools or completely funded in other fund pools. So um, that's kind of the breakdown of the general fund pools. I'll move on here to the the uh, CIS projects that we have going. We have 16 of these. Um, right now we have 12 of them that we're um, we're making pretty good progress on. We have four that we have not uh, still in the ranking stages on those. So we haven't allocated anything in those yet. So, um, you know, in here we have 67 assessments made, um, 37 uh, funded here, seven either partially or entirely funded in other fund pools. Getting down to the last page here, um, this is going to be the the national initiative funds. So. Um, the NWQI, the National Water Quality Initiative. Um, we have uh, quite a bit left there. We are going to have a second sign up for that. So, um, you know, this money will um, will be spending some more of that. The sage grouse, uh, we've spent that. Honeybee, um, we didn't end up getting enough applications to uh, allocate all that funds. We did turn 86,000 uh, back to national headquarters for those. Um, yeah, that's kind of the breakdown on the soil health. Uh, you know, we do have a little funds left there. Um, the wildlife or the windy fire. Um, we are in the progress of spending and allocating those right now. So um, once those are fun, we'll kind of have an idea of what we need to request for for the divide fire and the dry creek fire funds. So as an overall summary, um, you know, we we're going to allocate 18.85 million dollars for equip right now we have 17.7 uh, of that uh, allocated currently when we're all said and done we'll uh, fund 276 contracts uh, right now we have 251 of those allocated so we have about 25 to go so um, yeah we got 94 percent of our funds allocated as of right now so are there any questions All right, here are none. I guess uh, Christine is going to talk on uh, conservation, the conservation stewardship program. Thank you. Yes, good morning and thank you. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Christy Grant, uh, district conservationist out of the Sisseton office, and I will be providing you with Joyce's quarterly CSP report. So to start off, we'll go with the fiscal 21 CSP classics. The application deadline was March 31st. Uh, we had just over 1300 applications. The initial allocation was 7,850,000. April 1st fund request, we, re we received additional $2,260,000. With those combining funds, we were able to pre-approve 71 applications. The obligation deadline is set for September 3rd. Uh, we're just shy of halfway there with 34 obligated as of today. Um, if you are following along with Joyce's report, you'll see she has listed out individual fund pools in their initial allocation. I'm not gonna read you the list of fund pools in their allocations, but I will provide you with uh, 
the number of applications currently sitting at pre-approved for each fund pool. So we'll start off with the beginning former uh, statewide fund pool. 13 are pre-approved. Social disadvantage again is statewide. Six at pre-approved. Our organic is also statewide, and that is one. Uh, moving to the Brookings area, the Big Sioux Resource Unit has four. Coteau has four. Glacial Lakes has two. Upper James has five, and Vermilion has four. Uh, moving Central, the Pier area, Central Plains Resource Unit has three. Lower James has four. Lower Missouri has three. Mid Missouri has three. North Missouri has two. River Hills has four. And moving west, our Rapid City area, the Hills Resource Unit has two. Northwest has three. The Prairie has two. Southwest has four. And the Three Rivers has three. Uh, we received additional funds from North Dakota in the form of the RCPP CSP, Prairie Pothole Working Lands Funds. Um, we were able to pre approve 13 additional CSP applications under those RCPP funds. Uh, the July 1st fund request, I'm assuming we have not heard back for the additional funds we requested there. And to wrap it up with our fiscal 22 renewals, uh, the application deadline was April 7th. Uh, there was 344 applications. Um, those included all of our fiscal 17 CSP contracts that wanted to pursue a renewal. Uh, obligation will be set for the first quarter of fiscal 22, and we have not received our initial allocations for that. So with that, that wraps up Joyce's quarterly CSP. And I'll take any questions if there is any. All right. Thank you, Christina. Uh, it doesn't look like we have any questions right now, so I will move on down to Brandon Kotke for an update on ASEP and Water Bank. All right. Thanks, Jeannie. Good morning, everybody. I'm Brandon Kotke, the easement program manager. Um, let's go through our numbers here for the easements to Water Bank for the year. Um, hopefully, you guys can all see my screen here. Um, overall, for this year, we had 92 applications. Uh, it's a little bit of an increase over last year, so it's kind of good to see a little bit more interest in there. Um, where we're at right now, um, we have made um, our tentative offers to eight landowners at this time. Uh, we're looking at right around 612 acres for just under $3.5 million. So our goal is to have those obligated here in early August. We're still kind of working through some of our normal review procedures with these, but that's kind of where we sit with that. Um, as you can see, it looks like we are doing one easement that is a 30 year to a permanent conversion. Um, and then the remainder of those seven offers are for permanent easements. Uh, we did have two ALE applications as well. Uh, we're still working through the program agreement aspect of those. Um, so you can see there we had about 993 acres is roughly about what we were showing there. So uh, it's been a pretty good year for the easement so far. We're, Working through it had a little bit shortened time frame again this year, but uh, the crew was able to get through it pretty good. So, uh, if we go over to Water Bank, um, we are just in the process of wrapping that stuff up as well. Uh, we did get a significant uh, increase in our funds this year uh, for the Water Bank program between the North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota. There's only four million dollars uh, between the three states. I've seen the last few years where we're only getting around 400,000 roughly. Um, and this year we were just under 900,000. So uh, that gave us the ability to fund right around 20 applications for real close to 1,800 acres. So um, there was a pretty significant increase, I guess, in Water Bank this year as well. So that was really good to see. Well, that's what I got for you folks this morning on easements and Water Bank. If anyone has any questions for me, I got some time.
All right, thank you, Brandon. Uh, next on the agenda, we have an update from Deke Hobbick on wetlands and HEL compliance. You bet. Hello, everyone. My name is Deke Hobbick, Assistant State Conservationist for Compliance. Share some stuff here. <clears throat> Deke, most folks should have the handouts in their packet that came with the agenda. If you can't get that to pull up. Yeah, I'm not sure what my issue is. I just shared it earlier with some of my team members. So anyway, I will go over it. Basically, our wetland workload, um, it's looking at 569 data. Um, we got nine in progress, 13 completed, 25 received. Um, then our 1026 is, this is all from October 1st, 2020. Uh, 267 in progress, 930 completed, and then we received 901. So we're a little bit less than normal about every year since 2014, and we received about 1400. And uh, so I don't know that we're going to actually get all the way to 1400 requests this year by October 1st, but it could change just a little bit. Uh, the highly erodible land workload in South Dakota. Um, basically, I have the information up to July 15th. So there's 1,269 completed, 66 are outstanding, and then there's 621 that are considered new breakings. I just go ahead and track that information. So what I have on that. When you look at through the maps on different things here, when you're looking at received, the Southeast still tends to have the higher number of received uh, 1020, 1026 requests. Hutchison and Turner, um, Hutchison seems to be going strong as it has for the last 10 years. Uh, certified wetland determinations completed obviously kind of matches the numbers that are out there. Uh, when you look at, you know, the age of our 1026s, I mean, we're pretty well in control uh, for the most part, knock on wood. I mean, most of them are sitting in that uh, two to three months, and then there's just a handful that are sitting there in that six months, and that's usually tied to just procedurals, you know, dealing with when people want to do field visits or when they have time to meet with us. So that's not too bad at all. Um, Right, in progress, you know, like I said, that always seems to match a lot of what we have going as far as where the highest number of requests are at. You know, we are getting a few more west river. It's not dealing with tiling. It's usually dealing with a spring development or uh, some kind of planning, planning operation there. So, but anyway, that's what I have for an update on that. Are there any questions at all? All right, I'll turn it back to Jeannie. All right, thanks, Deke. Um, so next on the agenda, we're gonna go back to Colette Kessler for an update on where we're at with our conservation collaboration grants and cooperative agreements. Great, thank you, thanks, Jeannie. So um, again, this report will be rather short. We did have the call for proposals that closed in June and we received a nice batch of proposals. Thanks everyone for doing that. And then um, we had a nice uh, good size review committee from a multidiscipline committee from across the state go through the proposals and, and scored them out of how best might they help NRCS. How can these proposals, the results of these proposals help us to complete our mission of the uh, helping people help the land and, and uh, carrying out the farm bill responsibilities. So uh, as we went through them, uh, we have some really excellent things in there. That's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, the bad news is our budget isn't as strong as we thought it might be, as we anticipated it. So we're only able to fund uh, so far just a few of those. So we're starting to work through the list and uh, I guess we'll just see what we can do. And hopefully um, 
hopefully some more funding will come our way before it gets to be the cutoff dates. But uh, right now, um, I don't have a lot to tell or share and tell until we have some more, um, until things are in place. So, but please know uh, everyone uh, who have contributed to our proposal that we do appreciate your work and some of the ideas are really good ideas and maybe what we should do is look at how, you know, maybe there's another way we can work and do this. So maybe we want to continue this conversation and uh, at least, you know, continue it forward for next year as well. So uh, that's pretty much all I have for the CCCA and CCGA until next time. So thank you. All right, thank you, Colette. Any questions or comments on that process or where we're moving with that? All right, quiet bunch this morning. Um, so the next item that we have on the agenda, we did this last um, quarterly meeting as well, um, was to ask some of our partners to give a report on the agreement that they have in place with us and what um, what they're providing to NRCS and NRCS is providing to them in order to help build those relationships and get more conservation on the ground. So the first one that we're going to hear from this morning is Bruce Toy with Ducks Unlimited. Morning, Dean. Good morning, everybody else. Can you hear me OK? I can. Thank you. Oh, perfect. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and uh, try to share my screen here. All right, can you all see that? Hearing nothing, I'll assume so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, great. So yeah, uh, I thought I'd just uh, uh, touch on our RCPP project that, that Jeff talked about earlier. Uh, we were awarded through the alternative funding arrangement when this was first announced uh, back in early 2020. We thought it was a pretty uh, uh, great opportunity to, to utilize RCPP, as he said, and, and bring additional dollars into into our highest priority area, the Prairie Pothole region. Uh, so the, the title of the proposal is Scaling Soil Health in the Prairie Pothole Region, uh, really designed to help uh, you know, producers uh, uh, incorporate and enhance their soil health uh, management practices uh, on those important prairie pothole habitats. Uh, really, it's a great way to help retain uh, our intact grassland and wetland habitat on, on working lands in, in South Dakota, North Dakota, uh, and, and Montana. Uh, really, uh, you know, we understand soil health is a great way to add diversity to the landscape and, and, and help make our farms and ranches more resilient to fluctuations in, in markets and climate and also add, you know, biodiversity to our to our landscape as well. Uh, and really, uh, you know, these, these practices are, are critical for for water management for various purposes. When we first started writing this proposal, uh, of course, the big issue then was was how do we how do we manage all of this water on the landscape? Uh, and here we are now, less than you know, 18 months later. It's how do I how do I get more water into my crops and grass? And and really, uh, soil health is, is 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 the answer to both of those by by adding uh, you know organic matter to our soils and increasing soil structure and and, and water storage capacity. It's, it's it's the answer to both. So uh, uh, a, a good answer for a lot of things we're looking to accomplish in our highest priority area. Uh, just a timeline, uh, we started putting this together and, and submitted a proposal in, in May of 2020. Uh, we were awarded uh, last fall in September, and as, as Jeff mentioned, we've been working on getting that uh, initial agreement put together for a couple of months here. Uh, being a new program, the first time it's been uh, put together in this area, there's been a few uh, learning curves to accomplish, but I, I think we're getting getting close to having that done here in the near future, and I'm optimistic we'll be uh, moving forward here in the fall of, of 2021, getting agreements put together and, and, and practices uh, in, in place. Um, really, the, the crux of it is, is, is looking at expanding opportunities to improve soil health, uh, integrate perennial species in, in, in the cropping system and improving, improving grazing infrastructure for uh, you know, rotational grazing on, on both grasslands and in croplands on working lands. Uh, of course, the bulk of it will be, uh, in fact, 70% of, of the award is, is specifically for financial assistance to, to farmers and ranchers. Uh, we'll be using uh, the NRCS EQIP model for, for the bulk of that, uh, following those uh, practice standards for the practices we're looking at and uh, you know, the existing RCPP EQIP uh, payment rates you know, to outline what those 
what those reimbursement rates will look like. Uh, but there's also two two other you know important components of this project. Uh, second is is collecting environmental, financial, and social data uh, to help quantify some of the outcomes that 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 will result from this. We want to take this opportunity to to learn a lot uh, about what what's being accomplished by by some of these projects. Um, you know, first, uh, you know, looking at things like ecosystem services. Uh, how do these projects lead to uh, biodiversity uh, gains, and how do they impact water infiltration, water storage capacity, uh, sediment and nutrient runoff, wildlife habitat, uh, total system carbon accumulation? There's a lot of a lot of things that that we uh, we we assume uh, are, are positive outcomes. We want to add some add some data to that and and, and provide some local. Uh, examples in this part of the country on uh, to demonstrate success with these with these projects. Also, want to look at producer services. How do you know, how do these uh, how do we quantify gains uh, in, in yields, uh, net profit margins, return on investment? Uh, really focus on the economics of, of practice uh, adoption with these with these practices we're looking at. How do they pencil out in the long run? Uh, really try to identify some you know some pre and post scenarios and you know, what does it look like at the beginning and as we're developing these agreements over a over a five year term you know how have how have things changed from the producer and and landscape standpoint also want to look at a little bit you know at, at, at social implications of, of these practices you know and try to identify what what are those barriers that that producers are finding to to adopting some of these practices and and what really resonates with farmers and ranchers and help us identify what what works uh, that, that's best for DU and it's good for NRCS at the same time. Uh, third component here will be uh, you know focusing on ed education and outreach. Uh, if we can if we can you know help help producers implement these practices and then connect them uh, with with advanced education and mentorship opportunities, I think there's a you know there's a, a strong potential to help you know help help the program grow uh, and scale help scale up the adoption not only you know. On that particular farm and ranch, but maybe their their neighbor will take notice, and and that's how that's how things grow by by demonstrating success. So um, South Dakota has a we're blessed to have a strong you know mentorship network already across the state with with producers that are that are doing a great job with these practices. If we can connect a you know a, a, a newer uh, grower with with that mentorship network and help help develop the next generation, that would be uh, fantastic. And we, we want to focus on. Uh, the success stories that we can develop with, with these projects, you know, try to have field events and workshops and, and, and help demonstrate local success with these projects. So for, for financial assistance and actual uh, you know, projects on the ground, uh, focusing a lot on, on the soil health system. Uh, the, these four practices are, are EQIP practices. Those are the, the, uh, the EQIP uh, plan numbers on, on the right. Uh, but really focusing uh, on on cropland systems to reduce tillage, uh, incorporate cover crops, uh, increase our, our crop diversity, uh, and incorporate livestock and prescribed grazing on on, on cropland and and grass on grazing systems. So, um, of course, the, one of the limiting factors with with livestock grazing is the infrastructure that's needed on those cropland systems. So, there will be opportunities for cost share for. Uh, things like fence uh, and livestock water development on, on on cropland acres too. Again, we want to emphasize you know, incorporating uh, perennial species uh, in, into into cropping systems as well. So, equip practices like uh, range planting and hay and pasture planting will be available uh, to help restore some of those marginally productive uh, cropland acres back back into grass. Uh, and incorporate those into uh, into uh, some working land system, be it a uh, grazing system or or a hay uh, forage system like that. Um, one of the unique flexibilities we have with this RC. Bruce, you're muted. Is that better? Yes, uh, and it just happened about 15 seconds ago, so okay. we weren't uh, listening to you. Ah, well, I'm not sure how that happened. I wasn't even touching my mouse. But anyway, uh, looking to restore uh, perennial species on, on, on marginally productive cropland. Um, and, and one of the flexibilities we have with, with RCP period, 
RCPP is integrating uh, rental options as well. So looking at a at a CRP type model uh, for uh, producers that are that are restoring grass, you know, it, it can take uh, one to three years to, for that grass to fully establish, and at that time, you know, produce. Producers may not be, be generating any income at, on, on those acres, and that can be a, a detriment, and they may uh, may not have uh, want to give it the full time it needs, especially in drier periods right now. So if we can give uh, an annual income during that, that grass establishment phase, uh, that, that's a win-win, and hopefully uh, you know, let that, let that um, grass establishment fully develop before being incorporated into a, a grazing or, or hay management system. So of course there will be infrastructure there for for livestock grazing as well uh, on both restored grassland acres and and uh, existing adjacent grassland acres at the same time. Okay, uh, now now with these uh, applications we'll have a, uh, a a ranking scheme, and this will be similar to some of the previous uh, RCPP systems we've had. Uh, you know, our, our priorities are areas with the highest wetland density, so we'll be using uh, existing models that help us identify that. We call these thunderstorm maps, uh, basically areas with higher wetland densities. Uh, we think there's a lot of potential there to help uh, improve uh, soil health and, and, and improve man water management in, in those landscapes. Uh, so applications in those areas that are, that are reds and yellows will, will rank higher than areas that are in those lighter and darker blues. Uh, similarly, uh, applications that have more uh, more practices uh, will, will rank higher as well. If it's a, a comprehensive soil health system that has five or six practices, uh, that'll rank higher than an uh, uh, application with just just one or two. Um, and as we mentioned, the uh, you know our, our our goals to collect data and and provide local demonstrations. If, if producers are willing to cooperate with those, then and that's going to help help them rank higher in that in that application application process as well. Uh, DU couldn't do this alone, but you know by any means. So we were very fortunate to have a you know a, a broad diverse uh, group of partners come together. Uh, you know local, um, state and, and federal agencies. Um, uh, Nonprofit organizations, for-profit organizations, um, and, and producer-led coalitions that will all help us in, in varying aspects of this proposal here. Uh, really, a, a great coalition of partners that come together and brought over you know, over nine million dollars in, in partner contributions to get this project on the ground. So, just kind of the general process how we <clears throat> how we plan to roll this out, and as Jeff mentioned, <clears throat> excuse me, this is. There's still a few details to be figured out here, but this is this is kind of what we're thinking. Uh, we'll be uh, soliciting and ranking applications hopefully this fall. Uh, with the RCPP model, we have a little more flexibility uh, to have uh, things like batching dates and sign up periods, uh, and that's one thing that we want to help improve upon. Instead of having just uh, one single annual batching date, we want to be able to facilitate applications as, as rapidly as we can. Uh, kind of depend on, on the workload there, but might have to be a little flexible on how we roll that out. But you know, ideally, uh, what you know, what I'm thinking is we'll have a you know a pretty strict you know guideline for for a ranking criteria, and if a producer walks in and and, and is able to check all those boxes, uh, then we can proceed with that agreement. You know, right right then and there. If if the workload gets to be pretty high, then we might have to go to a you know a monthly or quarterly batching period or something like that. So we'll have to be a little flexible in that in that process. But once they once they do meet that criteria, we'll start uh, our, you know, our our biologists and agronomists will start developing a conservation strategy, identify what they want to do and and where they want to do it, uh, and then we will coordinate with NRCS staff to ensure that uh, both the producer and the site uh, all all fit within USDA guidelines for, for eligibility. Uh, if they pass that, we'll start working on an agreement uh, between the landowner and, and Ducks Unlimited. As Jeff mentioned, that'll be a little different than traditional RCPP, where the agreement has been between NRCS and the landowner. So this will be a little different model. Uh, but as I noted, we want to kind of say fit the similar guidelines with, with similar practice standards and, and payment rates. After that, the producer will implement the practices uh, as they are outlined in the agreement, uh, and then Ducks Unlimited 
uh, will reimburse the producer as as those practices are, are completed. And then we will seek reimbursement from from the NRCS as we uh, provide verification that those uh, practice standards have been met and then it'll probably be done on a, on a quarterly schedule um, through, throughout the year. That's kind of a broad overview. I uh, just want to provide some contact contact information for myself and the rest of uh, staff in South Dakota. We have two biologists and two agronomists that will be doing most of the legwork with this program. But if you have any questions, uh, feel free to follow up uh, with me. Give me a holler um, or if you know of any producers uh, that that may fit the bill or be interested in the program, feel free to let them know or or, or provide us uh, some contact information. But uh, with that, I'll certainly be here for some questions. All right, thank you, Bruce. Appreciate the the presentation. Are there any questions or comments? Oh, <laughs> um, then the next um, partner we have on here, Rocky Knippling, was going to visit with us a little bit on things going on with the James River Watershed Development District. Rocky, are you with us this morning? All right. Yes, I am. Trying to get my picture to come up here. Well, again, this is Rocky Knippling, and thank you for inviting me to speak today about our RCPP project. I have to apologize. I had some good drone videos and maps that I wanted to share with you today, but I've been in Missoula, Montana with my daughter the last two and a half weeks, helping her recover from a surgery, and I didn't have access to them all, so part of the good and the bad of teleworking. So. I wasn't able to share them with you today. Again, I'm Rocky Knippling. I'm a coordinator with the South Central 319 project in South Central and Southeast South Dakota. We are sponsored by the James River Water Development District. Our main task or goal is to improve water quality in our project area with a pool of funds that is distributed by South Dakota DANR. This project area includes the James River from north of Mitchell to the Missouri, the South Missouri from Chamberlain to the Yankton area, the Vermilion watershed area, and in western South Dakota we have a large area the Kepaha River drainage and Ponca Creek and Southern Trip and Southern Gregory counties. It's a large area and it encompasses about 8 million acres and our team includes Matt Cavanay and Shane Duranlo and myself. This broad area left us with many good projects that we couldn't fund every year due to a lack of funds and the 319 process was getting more competitive every year. So when the RCPP came out, we applied for that in 2016 and received funding the same year. We wanted to use the funds to target water quality and install practices that would have a direct impact on that as well. We were able to utilize ranking questions and with the help of Jen Wirtz and Jeff Vanderwilt, we were able to come up with a screening tool that would help us break the highs, mediums, and lows out. And it worked. We, our first batching or ranking we had was in 2018 and the total dollars of applications was more than what we had as a project 2.7 million but the process worked the questions and the screening tools sorted out our better projects and we were able to fund like 1.2 1.3 million the first go-round within a year we had another 
ranking. And at that time, we gave out the remaining dollars. Uh, we had lots of applications, quality applications for that. So at the end of the day, we were able to install practices that met our goals and objectives. We were very satisfied with the accomplishments that this project did, as well our sponsors were very satisfied too. So it was a win for everybody, a win for the producers, win for us, win for our sponsors. But we were left with three years left on our grant and no money. And then the caveat came out in the RCP program where you could do a request for renewal where they would inject more funds into your project. So we applied for that in 2019, but it was a very highly competitive round of funding and we didn't get selected. So we tried it again about a year ago in 2020 and we were successful in receiving another 2.7 million to match the original funding and a five-year extension. So the basis is we've been able to keep our framework from the original project and then this money would just be added to it. We wouldn't have to do the classic renewal and try to start a new project. The application for the renewal went better than the original application. There's an RCPP portal now that has been developed to make things easier for us to keep track and fill out the forms. And we are currently, we got selected in September, I believe, and we're currently just finishing up the negotiation phase, like Jeff said earlier. And we wish this part hand fell during the pandemic with the office shutdowns and internet connections, trying to work from home and all the things that go with that. But it's been successful so far. And I think we're about at the last step and then we will go to negotiations again to see if we can keep some of our original documents for the second go around. Uh, there's gonna be some challenges as they put before us that making things fit with the new CART program is gonna be a little testy at times, but um, I believe we can get through it. It was such a quality project the first go around. I hope we can repeat it this time. We had lots of satisfied producers and we got some excellent projects put on the ground and able to bring some new people to the arena that hadn't dealt with equip before so i believe all in all it was very successful um, it's been a journey for sure this last year but times like this just inspire us to keep our eyes on the prize and that is to help producers help the environment and make efficient use of the taxpayer dollars we spend I would highly recommend to any of the groups out there to go through this process. It is a good funding source for putting quality projects on the ground and it's not real easy sometimes to, but it can be dealt with to make things fit your goals and objectives. So with that, I'd like to thank you. And if there's any questions, I'll take them now. Well, I'm just going to say a quick thanks to Rocky and to Bruce for <clears throat> talking about their projects today. Um, and I hope to bring some of these other RCPP project coordinators to the next couple of state techs just to kind of give you guys an update from their perspective and, and kind of let you know how the whole RCPP uh, program is going and uh, obviously opportunities for producers and landowners out there. So. Thank you both for taking time today to give us an update. Yes, I would echo that. Thank you both for being here and providing those updates for the rest of the group.
Are there any questions or comments from anybody else on the call? Things that you'd like to discuss or share here with the group today? This is Mark Norton with South Dakota Game Fish and Parks. I just had a question for Rocky. What, what kind of projects were you guys funding with your RCPP? We were doing projects that, like I said, directly impacted water quality, uh, limiting the amount of access that livestock had to streams. We did feedlot projects. We put cover crops on some highly erodible grounds. Um, we planted grass, farm ground back to grass. And mainly it was like pipeline fence for the grazing part to try to help deter cattle from being in the streams as much. Thank you. Other questions or comments from anybody on the call? Related to anything we've covered or other topics you'd like to touch on before we adjourn today? All right, I'm not seeing anybody else come off mute or raise their hands. So I would just like to thank everybody for calling in today. And for those of you that presented, we appreciate the, the information shared with the group. And I know there's a lot of different things going on out there across the state. And we just appreciate everybody's involvement and input. So with that um i guess we will wrap up the meeting thank you again and take care we'll send we'll set up the next quarterly meeting and get that out to everybody